For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 5H. In this video, I will cover fusion beyond the iron peak. This essentially means the fusion of elements from iron all the way to uranium. I rated the physics level in this video as easiest. Let's start off by briefly recapping what we found in the previous videos in this chapter. So far in this chapter, we found that through various nuclear fusion stages, hydrogen in stellar cores is eventually fused into iron, as well as everything in between. Once you get to iron, stars cannot fuse beyond that. That's because iron and nuclei around iron have the lowest binding energy per nucleon of any nuclei. So when you're fusing from hydrogen all the way to iron, the fusion process releases energy, and that energy then serves to support the star against gravitational collapse. However, after iron, further fusion processes require energy to be put into the nuclei. And since we're no longer releasing energy through fusion, the star loses its pressure support system against gravity, and it collapses and eventually explodes in a core collapse supernova. So everything beyond iron cannot be fused inside of stars. So now that leaves the question, where do all of these nuclei from iron to uranium get made? And that's going to be the topic of this video. Essentially, there are two different mechanisms by which we can fuse beyond iron. One is proton capture, and the other is neutron capture. Let's start off with proton capture. This is called the RP process, which stands for rapid proton. I briefly touched on the RP process in Stellar Physics 5e when I covered the CNO cycle. Now the CNO cycle is for fusing hydrogen into helium, but in this schematic we can see in this goldish color we have the RP process. And this will kick in if the temperature is sufficiently high, but it's got nothing to do with the CNO cycle or hydrogen fusion. So how does this work? Well, it's basically exactly what it sounds like. It's rapid proton capture. So you're just going to pile on protons one after another, building up heavier nuclei. So to start off, we'll have some seed nucleus, which we'll call X, and it's going to have some mass A, A being the atomic number, or the total number of nucleons in the nucleus, meaning the total number of protons and neutrons. That seed nucleus is going to capture a proton and convert into a new species with one more proton. Remember that nuclear species are defined by the number of protons in their nucleus. So now this is a new species Y, and it's got a mass of A plus 1, since we've added a nucleon. This new species Y is now going to capture another proton and convert into another species Z with a mass of A plus 2. That species is then going to capture another proton, and the process keeps going piling on protons one after another, making heavier and heavier nuclei. Now, if you keep piling on protons one after another, eventually you're going to get unstable nuclei. And if it's extremely unstable, meaning that it will decay faster than it'll capture a proton, then you'll have some decay process mixed into this RP chain here. But that's the basic idea. You start off with a seed nucleus and you pile on protons one after another. Now, notice in this schematic here, that the RP process requires a temperature of T9 greater than about 0.5. T9 is the temperature measured in units of 1 billion Kelvin. The reason you need such high temperatures is because you're piling on protons which have positive charge, as do the nuclei since they're made up of protons and neutrons, and since both are positively charged, they want to repel each other due to the electrostatic force or the Coulomb force. So in order to actually fuse the proton onto the seed nucleus, it has to overcome this Coulomb barrier, meaning it's got to get close enough, essentially the two have to touch, for the strong nuclear force, which is responsible for binding nuclei together, to win over the Coulomb force. K is the Coulomb constant, it's just a number. Z is the charge of the nucleus, it's not this species here. So Z is the charge of the seed nucleus, the charge of, a, the, charge of the proton is 1 in units of electron charge, and R is the separation distance between the two. So this is actually a problem for the RP process, because the heavier the nucleus gets, the harder it is to pile on another proton. So it's difficult to get to very heavy nuclei via the RP process. You need very high temperatures. But we're going to see that's not the only problem with the RP process. If we now take a look at what's called the Valley of Beta Stability, which I covered in Stellar Physics 5b, as well as 5a actually, here we have a plot of all the nuclei with their charge or the number of protons on the vertical axis versus the number of neutrons on the horizontal axis. The black dots are the stable nuclei. This is the valley of beta stability. 
because they're stable against beta decay. Beta particles are electrons and positrons. Above the valley of beta stability, we have proton-rich nuclei, and below it, we have neutron-rich nuclei. For the RP process, we're piling on protons, so we're going to be in the proton-rich part of this plot. So what's going to happen? We're going to start off with some seed nucleus, let's say around iron, so it's going to be around here somewhere, and we're going to start off with a stable nucleus. So we're going to start off on some black dot here. We pile on a proton, that means we're going to move up vertically to a new nucleus, that's going to be in this green section. These nuclei are unstable to beta decay, but this is rapid proton capture, so because it's rapid, we're assuming we're capturing faster than we can beta decay. So we're just going to keep capturing, moving vertically, until we get to the edge of this green line where we start to see these dark red dots. These dark red dots are unstable to proton emission. So now we've got a situation where we capture a proton, but immediately we pop it right off. So it's difficult to move vertically now on this plot. So what's going to happen is, once we get to the edge of this plot, which is called the proton drip line, instead of capturing protons immediately, we're going to beta decay, converting one proton into a neutron. So this is going to move us down and diagonally to the right. And then we can capture another proton again, moving us back up. We're now back at the proton drip line, so we beta decay down and to the right again. And we're going to continue this process riding along this proton drip line. Now remember I said, the heavier the nucleus gets, the harder it is to capture a proton. So that's one barrier for the RP process. But there's also another problem. Once you start getting to these orange dots, especially here, but also here, since we're riding along the proton drip line, this is going to be a barrier as well, because these orange dots are unstable to alpha decay. So you're going to capture a proton, but then you're immediately going to pop off an alpha, which is a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. So in general, even if you have sufficiently high temperatures, it's very difficult to move past this area around here using the RP process, preventing you from making extremely heavy nuclei. So the RP process is thought to be a minor contributor to the production of heavy elements above iron. But it does take place, because we do observe what are called p-nuclei. These are nuclei that can only be made via proton capture. So clearly the RP process does occur somewhere in nature. And so now the question is, where does it occur? Well, you need a lot of protons to capture, so it has to occur in proton-rich environments. Generally speaking, our best candidate is in neutron star accretion disks. So this will be material that's in a tight orbit around a neutron star. So that covers the RP process. As I said, this is likely a minor process when it comes to nucleosynthesis beyond the iron peak. The next mechanism is neutron capture. And here we have two ways this can happen. One is called the S process and the other is the R process. S stands for slow and R stands for rapid. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please like and subscribe, maybe share it with a few friends. These videos do take a lot of time to make and it would really help me out. Okay, so let's start off with the S process. This is slow neutron capture. So we're going to start off with some seed nucleus X again with mass A, and we're going to capture a neutron, making an isotope of the same species with a new mass A plus 1. Now, because this is a slow process, let's assume for the sake of argument that it's unstable. If it's stable, it'll just wait around until it captures another neutron, and eventually you'll get an unstable isotope. So assuming that the new nucleus is unstable, it's going to wait around until it beta decays into a stable nucleus by converting a neutron into a proton. And now we have a new nucleus Y. It's a new species now since the number of protons has changed. It's got the same mass, A plus 1. And let's assume that it's stable for the sake of argument. Now that we have a stable nucleus, eventually another neutron is going to capture on it, making an isotope of our new nucleus Y now with a mass A plus 2. And again, we're going to wait around until this beta decays into a third species, still with the same mass. And now that new stable species is eventually going to capture a neutron. And the whole process of capturing a neutron, beta decaying to a stable nucleus, capturing another neutron, etc., continues making heavier and heavier nuclei. So the key for this process is that it's slow. And by slow, we mean that the neutron capture rate is considerably smaller than the beta decay rate. So each new nucleus has time to beta decay before it captures another neutron. 
the time scale for making heavier nuclei via the S process is about thousands of years. Now we have the R process. This is basically the same thing as the RP process, except we're rapidly piling on neutrons instead of protons. So we start off with a seed nucleus. It's going to capture a neutron, making an isotope of that nucleus. But now, because this is rapid proton capture, it's not going to have time to beta decay, and it's just going to capture another neutron, making an even heavier isotope. And again, before this one has time to beta decay, it's going to capture another neutron, and you keep going on like this, piling on one neutron after another. Now, just like with the RP process, eventually you're going to get to an extremely unstable nucleus where it will beta decay faster than capturing a neutron. But you get the basic picture. The timescale for moving up this chain to make heavier nuclei for the R process is of order seconds. So just to recap the S process versus the R process, they're both capturing neutrons. The only difference is, in the case of the S process, the decay rate of the new isotopes is much faster than the neutron capture rate. But in the case of the R process, the neutron capture rate is much faster than the beta decay rate. So now let's take a look at where these take place on our valley of beta stability. We're again going to start with a stable nucleus somewhere around here, and we're going to capture a neutron. So this is going to move us one nucleus to the right on this plot. And let's say we're now in an unstable nucleus, so we're on one of these light blue dots. For the S process, we're going to wait around until this nucleus beta decays by converting a neutron into a proton. So that beta decay is going to take us up and to the left, diagonally, back into the valley of beta stability. Now we capture a neutron until we get to an unstable nucleus. And again, that's going to beta decay back into the valley of beta stability. And we're going to move up like this in this sort of zigzag pattern, riding along the edge or the bottom edge of the valley of beta stability. And unlike the case of proton capture, neutrons have no charge, so we don't have to worry about a Coulomb barrier. So we can just move up this chain with no problem, and we don't care what temperature it is. There is nothing preventing neutrons from piling onto your seed nuclei, as long as you have some neutrons around. So this will make everything up until the edge of the valley of beta stability. For the R process, we're again going to start with a seed nucleus, let's say down here somewhere, and we're going to capture protons rapidly. So we're just going to keep moving to the right, until we get to the edge of these light blue dots where we have these darker blue dots as well as these red dots and these are unstable due to neutron emission. So now this is exactly analogous to the RP process. We reach the point where the nuclei are unstable due to neutron emission. This is called the neutron drip line. In the case of the RP process it was the proton drip line. And so even if we pop on a new neutron it's just going to pop right back off. So once we get to the neutron drip line, we're going to zigzag our way up here along the neutron drip line, making heavier and heavier nuclei. And we can basically go as far as we want, because again, there's no Coulomb barrier to worry about. So neutron capture, the S process and the R process, are thought to be the primary mechanisms for making nuclei beyond the iron peak. So now we have to ask, where do these processes take place? The S process takes place in certain types of red giant stars. Now, I said at the beginning of this video that you cannot fuse beyond iron inside of stars. Well, that's not strictly true for the S process. This actually does take place inside of stars. For the R process, you need to have a lot of neutrons around. So you need to be in a neutron-rich environment. So where would that be? If you open any introductory astronomy textbook, they will pretty much all say that the R process takes place in supernovae. And for a while, that's what people thought. They would run simulations of supernovae and they'd have no problem making everything from iron to uranium. The problem was initially, these simulations did not include neutrinos. Then people started including neutrino physics and found that there was a problem. So what happens when you include neutrinos? Well, let's remind ourselves what we need for the R process. We need neutron-rich environments. So we need a high neutron to proton ratio, meaning we need a lot of neutrons per seed nuclei. Another way to put this is that we need this quantity Ye to be very small. If you've been watching this series, you'll know that Ye comes up a lot in astrophysics. It's just the number of protons divided by the total number of nucleons. For the RP process, we need the exact opposite. We need a low neutron to proton ratio, meaning we need a Ye close to 1. Now to start off with, in a supernova, Ye is low, but it's not super low. It would be better if we could get it lower. 
But initially, when we ran simulations, this wasn't a problem. You could still make everything up until uranium. Then we added neutrinos. Well, what happens if you include neutrinos? If you have neutrinos around, you can get the following interactions. A neutron plus an electron neutrino can convert into a proton plus an electron. So what is an electron neutrino? There are three types of neutrinos. Electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. So for this process, we just need electron neutrinos. So this is going to convert your neutrons into protons. We don't really care about this extra electron here. If you have protons around, they can capture an anti-electron neutrino and make a neutron plus an anti-electron or a positron. So both of these combined will tend to bring Ye to one half. Because if you have a lot of neutrons around, they tend to convert them to protons. And if you have a lot of protons around, they tend to convert them to neutrons. Now, we already said the RP process is a minor process. So let's just take a look at the R process. It's exactly the same thing for the RP process. Let's say we have a neutron-rich environment. So we have a seed nucleus, and it's surrounded by a bunch of neutrons. Now we introduce neutrinos. An electron neutrino comes in, captures on this neutron. It's going to convert it to a proton. That proton is then going to go find another neutron and fuse into a deuteron. And somewhere nearby, the exact same process is going to happen. Now we have two deuterons, and they're going to fuse into an alpha particle. And alpha particles are very stable. Once you make alpha particles, they like to stay as alpha particles. Now the first thing you might be thinking is, especially if you've watched previous videos in this series, neutrinos don't really interact with anything. So yeah, this might happen, but it's extremely rare, so who cares? That's true. The probability of a single neutrino interacting with anything is very low. However, in a supernova, there are an enormous amount of neutrinos. Something like 10 to the 50 per second are emitted, or even more. So even though the probability is low, there's so many neutrinos around that you're still going to have a lot of these interactions taking place. And what does this do? Well, effectively, it's going to take your neutrons and convert them into alpha particles. But we need the neutrons for the R process to take place. So in supernovae, this enormous flux of neutrinos is going to lock up all of your neutrons into alpha particles, and you're going to kill the R process. You don't have any neutrons around anymore to capture onto your seed nuclei. And this process of locking up your neutrons into alpha particles is sometimes called the alpha effect. So this is actually still currently a major problem for our process in supernovae. So how bad is this problem? Let's take a look at the relative nuclear abundances of the various nuclear species. So on the vertical axis, I have the relative abundances of all the nuclei. And on the horizontal axis, I have nuclei arranged by mass number. Here we have the iron peak. So everything before this, everything from hydrogen to iron, is made inside of stars. This is the measured relative abundances of everything beyond the iron peak. Without neutrinos, we can make all of this no problem. But as soon as people started introducing neutrinos, the R process got stunted before you could get to uranium. Well, maybe these heavier nuclei are not made through the R process. But looking at this graph, we know that the R process is the dominant mechanism for making heavier nuclei beyond iron. And the way we know this is there are various peaks in this abundance plot. If you notice, there are three peaks after the iron peak. When we take a look at these peaks, we see that they're all double peaks. And these orange peaks match what we would expect from an R process. The pink peaks match what we would expect from the S process. So this is actually very good evidence that the R process is one of the main ways for making nuclei beyond iron. Somehow we have to get around this neutrino problem. So how bad is this problem? Well, that varies somewhat based on the parameters and the conditions of your simulation. But generally speaking, when you include neutrinos, the R process gets stunted around the second peak. Sometimes a little before, sometimes a little bit after. But it's very difficult to get to this third peak when including neutrinos. And even the second peak is a little bit iffy. We'll get into the details of supernovae in a future video. For now, even though your textbooks say everything beyond iron is generally made in supernovae, that's actually an open question now. Another primary candidate for the R process is neutron star mergers, sometimes called a kilonova. Here we get two neutron stars, which are pretty much entirely made up of neutrons. They collide, 
and they eject a bunch of material. Now, this collision also emits an enormous amount of neutrinos, but we start off with a very low YE, so that helps a lot. Also, in neutron star mergers, you'll get material from the neutron star that is ripped off due to tidal forces prior to the actual collision. And in that case, there aren't any neutrinos yet, so all of that material that's ripped off will make everything up to uranium. The problem with neutron star mergers is typically they make a black hole. And the question now is, of this material that's ejected, how much of it actually is ejected versus how much falls back into the black hole? Because if you make a bunch of R-processed material and it falls back into the black hole, well, that's completely useless. The other problem with neutron star mergers is how often do they happen? They're thought to be much less frequent than supernovae. Supernovae are fairly common. Neutron star mergers we don't think are that common. We're not really sure, actually. Now that we have gravitational wave detection, we can actually detect them. So we're going to find out just how common they are in the upcoming years. There's a third candidate, which is neutron star black hole mergers. In this case, there are no neutrinos. There's no high energy collision that's going to create a bunch of neutrinos because a black hole is not really an object. However, these are probably even less frequent than neutron star mergers. And the only way to get material out is by tidal forces ripping off material from the neutron star and that material cannot fall back into the black hole. So where exactly the R process takes place is still an open question. We've got some pretty good candidates and likely it's some combination of all three. That's the end of chapter 5. We've covered all the fusion processes from hydrogen all the way to uranium. And in the next chapter, we're going to move on to star deaths and the final stages of the stellar life cycle. So if you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified for the release of future videos. And if you have any feedback or questions, please leave them in the comments. Thanks for watching.